Stories awakening possibility social impact. Creating a culture of compassion, connection, and collaboration. You are listening to Hollyhock Talks, a podcast about the teachers and luminaries that make Hollyhock extraordinary. Hollyhock is Canada's leading leadership learning centre, located on Cortez Island. Hollyhock Talks brings a little piece of Hollyhock magic to you, wherever you are listening. This is Farah of Hollyhock Talks, and I'm delighted to be here with Philip Moore. Philip Moore was inspired by Buckminster Fuller in the 1970s to create a new model for educating children, and this became the Upland Hills Farm School in Oxford, Michigan. He's also author of The Future of Children, a love-based education for every child. And we're here to talk about these two very important subjects for our times today, love and children. Welcome, Philip. Thank you so much, Farah. It's a pleasure to be with you. So let's start with the principal tenets of a love-based education. Well, when I was working with Bucky and uh, getting rewired, there was a thing that he said that just riveted me and cut right through to my soul. It was that every child is born a genius. And it's my conviction from having watched a great number of babies grow up that all of humanity is born a genius and becomes the genius very rapidly by unfavorable circumstances and by the frustration of all their inbuilt capabilities. So that became a mandate for me. So when I was going to school, I realized that there were lots of things about school that seemed to be rigged against this idea of being loved into being. And I was wired to, from a very early age, think about what it would be like to be in a very different kind of school. And it was Bucky who really said to me, you know, you need to stop being a critic of education and do something, create something that has is based on generalized principles and it could be done throughout the world and be committed to making the other institution obsolete. So love-based and fear-based really came to me as a way of doing it and being able to explain it. So we all know what a fear-based education is. You're going to be judged and ranked and made to compete with each other. And that there'll be a valedictorian of a class when you're in high school. And clearly that's supposed to be the winner of the game. And everyone else is somehow underneath that valedictorian. And the love-based education has a completely different foundation. The first thing is that every child is born a genius. And so that's when you learn to listen from a very different place, because if you truly believe that, then you listen beneath the surface of things. And listening in that way, the child becomes a teacher. So right away, you have a paradigm shift where instead of the teacher has all the answers and the curriculum is what's driving everything in, in, the, in the school, you really have a very different context. Already you've said a bunch of things that I want to explore a little deeper. So hold on to that thought. Listening and viewing the child as a, as a teacher. How do you encourage teachers to do this or teach the skills of listening beneath the surface? Well, we really looked to find teachers that it wasn't really their credentials we were looking for. We were looking for their curiosity and their empathy, their ability to to build bonds and to have compassion. And so it was like a primary absolute necessity for the people that we hired to be great listeners. And a great listener is someone who gives you full attention And very often, if we think of some of the teachers that we've had, it wasn't their job to really get to know us or to see that divine spark within us. 
you know, their job was to get this content delivered. And so when you select teachers from that point of view, it's a very different thing. It has to do with creating a bond and deep empathy and sensitivity are required. Now, you also said something that's very fundamental and very different from how we think about children, seeing a child as a teacher. Yes. So can you speak a little bit more about how how that plays out in bring, loving a child into being? Well, um, when you're with a child and you greet a child uh, eyes to eyes, and you sense their throbbing spirit and the energy inside of them, you're really in the presence of the beginner mind. And there's something just so refreshing and alive. There's a vibrancy and vitality that's there. So the listening is really listening to that spirit. I was with uh, my brother's grandchild, Danny, today, and we were walking around on a golf course. And Danny has this thing where he starts jumping up and down with joy and shaking his hands. And you can just feel the electric current of life going right through his body when he's joyful. And when you think of our schools and, uh, and the situation of having to be still primarily between 9 and 3.30 and to always be instructed and told what to do and where to go and the very little time that they get to go outside and be underneath the sky. A child who's like Danny, who's just moving and in his body and very kinesthetic is really a distraction. And sometimes we know with ADHD that there's a lot of children that are medicated. So you would think of a child like that and you see that vitality and you say, it's our job to protect, nourish, nurture, and defend that vitality. We want that vitality to be very much alive when when he gets to be 14 years old and he's on the stage and graduating from our community so learning how to listen is really learning from that child and seeing that by that vitality and knowing that that's an essence Mm -hmm. now you mentioned something that I know is very important in the educational model you're talking about, and that is children being outside under the sky. How important is nature to this new paradigm? It's essential. The natural world as a primary teacher is an essential tenant of, of love-based education. So one of the reasons that I'm so excited about the Hollyhock Conference and being on Cortez Island is having not yet set foot on the island, I already feel the call of it. And one of the things that we intend to do when we gather as a circle at Hollyhock is to really let the island be our teacher, just the way we were talking about children being our teacher. And there are ways that we can use meditation and we could use things like the mutual awakening practice in order for the island to be very present in our hearts and in our souls and to be led by something other than our own agendas of what's going on. So children as a uh, nature as a primary teacher is also a way of teaching context. And so in a place like Michigan, where there are four distinct seasons, we actually teach the season. So it's, it's so alive for the children when it's spring, it's about, the maple sap running in the trees and and then boiling that sap down and making maple syrup and it's the awakening of the swamp and it's the caddisfly larva and it's the cattails that are beginning to emerge and so for the children at a school like ours being out under the sky which we refer to as sky time a child has the opportunity in a day at our school say between 9 and 3 30 to be outside under the sky for half of every day if they choose to. That's marvelous. And at the time that you were putting these principles into action and developing the school, did you have any idea of how critical that connection to nature would be given global climate change and the state of affairs in the world? 
Yes, actually, we were drawn to it because, um, well, I look at Hollyhock and the invitation that I've received to be there kind of like summer camp. And I was a summer camp counselor. And the really the point of summer camp, at least the experimental one that I was a counselor at in the upper peninsula of Michigan between Lake Michigan and Lake Superior, the whole point of it was to be together in a community in a very remote place. We were in the center of the Hiawatha National Forest and to fall in love with being there and to have a great time and to want to come back next summer. You know, so there were so many things that occurred in a community like that, that we just began to intuitively feel that this is the way school would be. Very often at the end of summer camp, you could be very sad because you've had this experience of community and a village of being in the natural world and nourished by it in all of the ways that you can be nourished by it. And then you're going to go back to these institutions that were really formed during the industrial era and much more like factories than they were, you know, alive, vibrant places like forests and, and mountains and the edge of a, of a sweet sea. So we knew that our job wasn't really to teach them the specifics of like environmental education. This is a deciduous tree and this is a conifer and conifers means it's cone bearing. I mean, all those things are fine, but we really knew that if they were out under the sky near the edge of a swamp, they would fall in love. Once you fall in love, then you protect, nourish, nurture, and defend the natural world. She's in your heart and you're always connected to her. Mm -hmm. Love is a very strong motivation. Yeah, it's what makes everything work. <laughs> and and you can't really you you can't really will it into existence. So we knew as teachers that if the kids were out and they were playing in under the sky and around these hills of upland hills, you know, that they would fall in love. And once they fell in love, we knew that that was the essential ingredient for the vitality and liveliness and connection that would become their life. And they would be loved into being the one comment that they make when they go back into high school. And many of them go to traditional high schools after Upland Hill school the, the one comment that we've heard over and over again, it wasn't how difficult it was to adjust socially. It wasn't the amount of homework and how difficult it was to take tests and to do well. It was sitting in a classroom for most of the day and not being able to be outside. That speaks a lot about their connection to nature. So you mentioned something earlier on about learning together rather than learning as individuals. How is that fostered? Well, collaboration and cooperation are essential values of a school like ours. So there's lots and lots of opportunities for kids to do that. Even test taking can be done that way. And so we foster this idea of collaboration and Probably the most dynamic and dramatic thing we did in the school's history was the seventh and eighth grade teacher, Ted, came to me one day and said, I have a comprehensive unit. and I'm calling it the bridge unit. And um, we would like to construct a footbridge between Upland Hills School and Upland Hills Ecological Awareness Center. And in building the bridge, we would be teaching about the bridge between adolescence and adulthood and about the metaphoric bridge that's in so many songs and so many poems and the bridge between leaving our school and going to another. So in 1992 and 1993, this group of seventh and eighth graders built a bridge, which has become a central feature of our campus. And that's an idea that that's how collaboration is actually in a living context. It's not to do a group project and present you know, beautiful poster boards talking about, you know, the origin of uh, the origin of amphibians and how they developed and how they came to be. It's it's doing something that functions as an everyday artifact to remind us of what's possible when there's a scaffolding in place that allows us to really do something that seems like a miracle. Every time I walk over the bridge, I remember the seventh and eighth graders who built it. Mm, that's remarkable. 
Were there any challenges that you had to overcome in the the history of the school that really stand out as as something that brought deep insight? Well, yes, there are many, uh, really. I mean, the the early challenges was really to be able to communicate effectively to the parents why we were doing things so differently. So the kids were never in grades. We didn't have first grade and second grade and third grade. And the morning sessions were done in what we called morning meetings. And the children knew the teachers by their first names. And then we had mathematics and logic separate, separated out so that the children would be able to learn that as a line of intelligence. And then the afternoons, we allowed them to choose or we created an opportunity for choice to exist. And then every day would be different. And it would have five or seven choices at one o'clock and five or seven choices at two o'clock. And the week could offer 10 different passion-driven courses that kids could take, like wild foods and swamping and theater play shop and movie making, those kinds of things. And parents were, were asking lots of questions. When are they going to learn how to do this? And are they on the same level as third graders? And are, are all third graders doing this? So we had to come up with a language so that we could speak directly to the parents about developmental education and why we grouped them the way that we did and explain Piaget. And then Howard Gardner came along with a the theory of multiple intelligence. And so we started to be to use those those words and those theories, those educational theories, and and explain that there are 13 lines of intelligence. And, you know, would, don't you want your child to be exposed to the line of intelligence called music? and to interpersonal intelligence and to intrapersonal intelligence. But I would say that by far the, the most difficult time for us was also a time that yielded the greatest learning. Uh, we transported kids to and from, and we still do. Uh, the school doesn't run the transportation any longer, but in the early days we did. So we had a Dodge Maxi van with 18 children and we were picking kids up 30 or 40 miles away from the school and bringing them to the school. And one beautiful April day, that bus was in an accident. A uh, drunk driver with two other people who were also drunk struck the bus and the bus uh, rolled three times. And the first time it rolled, it killed one of those students. And as a young director, I came upon that scene and um, I felt as soon as I saw it, that this is, it, there's nothing worse that could possibly have happened. And so being there with the kids who were, uh, who were in a terrible state, one of them had a, a brain injury, one of them had internal injuries, you know, and then getting through that time and the way the community rallied and then who those children are to this day and how we got through that time, I think that was, in my view, that was one of the biggest challenges. And how did the community come together throughout the grieving process? Well, it immediately came together. Even that day when I was in the emergency room and a parent came towards me and I looked at him and, and I said, Jim, Jonathan and Beth are okay. Jonathan has a broken collarbone. Beth has minor bruises. And then he came over to me and uh, he opened his arms. And so he was giving me a hug and he said, how are you? You know, and I, I said, I don't know. And then he said, the school must continue. At that point, I just dropped. I just couldn't believe it because in my head, the school was already over. It was done. It would not continue. And so even that very first day, there was a message from something beyond us. It was a universe message that we were going to get through this. And so we got back. It was a Friday. We were back together on Monday and we all met by a fallen tree, a tree that had just been Midsummer Night's Dream, the set for Midsummer Night's Dream. And, um, and we sang the songs and we held each other and we got back to Cool. Thank you for sharing. That's a very beautiful 
beautiful story to share. Yeah, you're welcome. In the very beginning of the interview, you mentioned bonding. And I'd love to explore a little bit how important the bond between teacher and children is. It's absolutely essential. And, uh, and it, it's absolutely essential that the bond be authentic. So it's something that you have to earn. And you have to earn through the way that you deal with boundaries and the way that the children know that they're being loved and the way that you're consistent and the way that they, they know inside who you are. And children are really great at being able to detect bullshit. And also, the, they're very good at being able to detect the persona, the thing that we want to show others, and to know underneath that persona who you are, because we can say things to children that this is how you should behave or this is how you act, you should be acting. And, and yet they look to us not for what we say, but who we are and what we do. And so the bond is absolutely essential, which is why in a developmental school like ours, the teacher stays with a, a class for a minimum of two years. And so they have what we call, uh, you know, the initial year and then the leadership year. And all throughout the whole school journey, we have hired a staff that really is best friends. And one of the things that we're modeling is that friendship. We became so close that the average uh, teacher um, in, in terms of the core teachers of the school was something like 20 to 25 years of, um, of service to the school. And in some cases, there are now people that are teaching today that taught a lot longer than I did. And I was there from the first year. So I taught for 42 or 43 years. There's a teacher there today who's taught for 45 Wow, that's remarkable. That says a lot about the environment at the school. So you've written a book. I know that there is a chapter in the book about viewing children as sacred and that every child has a genius. So I'm wondering if you can give us a sneak peek or give us a little taste of what exactly is in that particular chapter. Well, towards the end of the book, after starting with a chapter on children as teachers and then going, you know, from that to children as developmental beings and going to children being on the edge of evolution, I ended with this idea of what does the future of children depend on. And so I'll read from that page. The future of children depends on us being led by the sacred child. This sacred child lives in every one of us. This sacred child lives in the children that have come before us and the ones who have yet to be born. This sacred child is not separate from us. She is us. This sacred child comes through us and yet does not belong to us. She belongs to the cosmos. This sacred child is the reason we must change our story. The sacred child holds the potential for the future that is always pressing into the present. We must learn to listen to her as she charts a new direction for our species. Very beautiful to think of the sacred child within all of us. Yeah, it's really what I uh, hope to do with the group that's uh, going to emerge at Hollyhock is create a direct experience of the next paradigm of education because it seems to me the next paradigm of education is so different in that all of us need to be teachers and learners. And all of us need to be learning within a context that has deep meaning and that wakes us up to be able to protect and nourish and defend the natural world. 
and really act with a kind of maturity that we as a species have yet to demonstrate. So the best way I think for that to happen is to create a direct experience of what the next paradigm of education would actually feel like by inviting the people who are in the circle that, that show up to tune in not only to the natural world and to the island, but to each other and to create uh, bonds of friendship that allow us to be whole human beings, shadow and light together, and then to be creative in a way with meditation, especially with meditation and sauntering together around the island to be able to tap into living in a world where we don't know what's going to happen next. And we know for sure that some new potentials need to emerge. So we have to break a form of conditioning in order for that to happen. And so um, I'm hoping that over these four days, there's a tremendous burst of creativity that comes from being able to live in the unknown and being able to rely on our connectedness and to rely on the bonds of our relationships and our deep love, not only for each other, but for the natural world. So that's my hope for the time that we get back on the ferry and leave the island is that we will have had a direct experience of the new paradigm, the new educational paradigm. It sounds like it's going to be a very rich and fulfilling experience for those who attend. That's what I'm hoping. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you and hear some of the insights and wisdom and things that you have to share through through pioneering this new model. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to do this. Stories, awakening, possibility, social impact. Creating a culture of compassion, connection, and collaboration. You are listening to Hollyhock Talks, a podcast about the teachers and luminaries that make Hollyhock extraordinary. Hollyhock is Canada's leading leadership learning centre, located on Cortez Island. Hollyhock Talks brings a little piece of Hollyhock magic to you, wherever you are listening.